Let's get started. Appreciate it, Brian. Brian's the real hero here, guys. He just, man, that atmosphere, just hanging out. Anyway, all right. Uh, before I begin, a pretty strong PG-13 warning today, because uh, we're talking about men and marriage. And so I'd want zero nasty emails or Facebook comments or anything of that nature. Uh, so just so you're aware, we got wonderful kids areas all the way up through your middle school or into seventh grade. Uh, but PG-13 on that. So we're in our series called Act Like Men that we started last week. And last week we talked about the question of what is a man. I would highly encourage you uh, to go back and watch that if you were not a part of that last week. Uh, but we started with this. We have a key verse for this series, and it comes from 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 16, 13 through 14. It says this, uh, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, and be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. And I love the symmetry of that verse because it says, you know, be watchful, stand firm, act like men, be strong, not so that you can lloyd it over, not so that you can be the bully, so that you can do all of those things in strength and in love. And so our key phrase, kind of for the whole series, but specifically last week, was this, that when men step into their purpose, everything flourishes, but where they refuse, everything Burns That God has given men a unique placement in society and in the family that when men don't live up to their calling, uh, things go bad for everybody around them. So today we're going to be talking about men and marriage. And as a disclaimer, this is going to be certainly for both spouses, but I am going to be specifically talking to the men today. Uh, so, so ladies, if you're in here, I still want to encourage you. I am not giving you ammunition to jug him in the side to talk about, well, you know, the pastor said when you leave, like, don't put me in your mouth later. You know, uh, that is not what this is about. And so I, I am trying to encourage your men, and specifically to you men, I am not here to fuss. This is equally as challenging to me. I have to put this stuff together and then actually try to live it because my wife sits in the room. So how about that? How about that? I got to talk about it and then go home and say, like, did you hear what I just said? You know, so... I am here to challenge you not to fuss or to downgrade because we got enough of that in our society, but here to build up. And we men are made to be challenged. We are our best when we are challenged. So I want to start with this. Strong marriages are the foundation of a strong society. That's something that every Christian believer must understand. That strong marriages are the foundation of a strong society. And the reason that's the case, and this isn't just my opinion, it's certainly biblical, but the world sees this as well, is because all relationships stem from the father and mother relationships. And we know this practically because many of us, our hurts and hangups possibly come from bad parenting. You know, come because of something that happened in our childhood with our parents. Our dad wasn't there, or or you know, or mom and dad divorced. There was an you know, there was a it was a loveless marriage or whatever. You know, all of those scenarios. But strong marriages are the foundation of a strong society, and these relationships, the marriage, thrive. All these other relationships thrive most when the father and the mother relationship, the marriage relationship, is heavy. So so it's easy. I can say in confidence that parents, your greatest blessing to your children isn't the car that you buy them when they're 15, isn't the house that you put them in or the school that you put them or the education you pay for in college. It is your healthy marriage that is the greatest blessing of their life. Like that is by far and large every indicator a present mother and father in the home who love the Lord, who love each other and then love their kids in that order, Lord each other and then kids, not kids over parents, not I got a baby now and you're second fiddle. Like that's not how that works. It is the marriage union because your kids will leave. They're supposed to anyway. They should one day. But you are together forever, as our vows say, until when? Until death do us part. That's what we all proclaim before the Lord, mind you. I'm a pastor. I say, in the presence of the Lord and these witnesses, I now pronounce you. So, I'm not here to, uh, anyway, let's get over there. All right, so what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, for, for a little bit of what marriage is not, because I think we need to clear the air about some, some maybe misconceptions about what marriage is. I want to talk about what marriage is not, and the first thing is this. Marriage is not a prison. Marriage is not a prison. Well, pastor, why do you say that? Well, because your spouse is not your, what do we say? The old 
ball and chain, right? And, and, and it happens all the time, and specifically within television and TV, and we watch movies about this all the time, right? You hear a guy, a guy's getting married, he gets into like the bachelor party, and what do everybody say? Oh, man, I can't believe she what? She's locked you down. I can't believe, man, you're not going to be able to do anything that you want to do anymore. I can't believe that you, you know, you're going to be, you know, locked into some, you know, some relationship forever. And, and I hate, because listen, marriage is not prison. Marriage, from a biblical perspective, is a blessing. Marriage is a blessing. How do you know this? Literally, in Genesis 3, that means it's the third chapter for those of you counting. God creates man. He says what? It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. So what does he do? He creates from the man a helper to be joined into union with the man so they may become one. So man will leave his father and mother and they will become one flesh. So it is not good for man to be alone. And this whole idea of culture locking marriage into some kind of prison sentence is because we must understand as Christian believers that we have an enemy out there who wants to distort and break everything that God has tried to bless us with. That's always what the enemy does. He's going to try to take, and excuse my French, but bastardize everything that is a blessing of God and make it something that's almost just like it, but not really like it. He does it with sex. He does it with our parenting. He does it with our relationships. And he certainly does it with our marriages. And he makes it look like marriage is something to be run away from instead of one of the best blessings that God has given us. Marriage is a blessing made by God for humanity. And I'm not the only one that believes this. A Harvard study... A Harvard study showed, just a few little stats, because I love a stat. Marriage in men, a Harvard study said that married men live longer on average than single divorced men. They, along, the longer a man stays married, the greater his survival advantage is over his single and divorced peers. And never married men are three times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than married men. Brother, she's not a prison. She's quite literally keeping you alive. And we ought to know this because how many statements when a bunch of guys get together usually end up with, watch this. Y'all watch this, right? Or how many times have you said, honey, I have a great idea. And she goes, is it a great idea though? Is it really? Or should you be eating that? And this whole time thinks she's nagging you, bro, she's trying to get you to 80, you know? Stop, you know, to eat the food that she, she gives you that's the healthy stuff, you know? So marriage is not a prison. Marriage is a blessing. Uh, one last thing on this is a little bit of a personal thing. I want you to start trying to look for yourself and pick this out. I was watching a movie the other day. I'm not going to name the movie. It doesn't matter. But I see it all the time. It's a trope. It's a stereotype. There are two major tropes that you see men in popular culture. One is the dad who's an idiot. The dad who doesn't know what he's doing. You know, he like he shows up and it's like, I'm dumb and I don't know what to do here. You know, I, I, hate, I hate that trope because, again, it's downgrading to men. And we can not downgrade men and at the same time not downgrade women too. It's actually quite possible to do that. And so we don't have to play men as idiots. So that's the first one. The second one is the trope where you see the married guy bumps into his college buddy who's still single. And the whole time he's like, oh, gosh, man. You're still single? Oh, gosh, man, good, good for you, man, good for you, as he pulls away in his minivan with the wife sticker with the kids and the dog. And see, again, that's a common trope that we see in our society that your children are seeing, your sons and daughters are seeing, and so it's no wonder. It's like, well, marriage is, why are you getting locked down? The old ball and chain, that's a lie from the pit of the enemy. And, and listen, guys, don't listen to the advice of the men you work with, because more than likely, I don't know them. And I could be speaking uh, improperly, but more than likely, they're idiots. They don't know a thing about marriage. Most of them are on their third or fourth. That's not who you take advice from. That's why you need to be in Christian community, right? Because most of those guys are speaking from their pain, not from wisdom. You, look, you, you always look to wisdom and not pain. All right, that's the first thing. Number two, marriage is not all about your happiness. Marriage is not all about your happiness. Ephesians 5, 25 to 26 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And what? Does anybody ever like giving anything ever? Think about that for a second. That's why we have to train our children so hard. So, it's so difficult to share, to give, to not hit when they have a toy taken. And yet we men, we, we men, this is just for the men right now, 
love your wives across all the church, and as he gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her, talking about her wife, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. So you are to give yourself for your wife. So marriage is not all about your happiness. The primary purpose of godly marriage, listen, is to make you holy, not happy. Now, now what does that practically look like? The reason it makes you more holy and more like Jesus is when Jesus came, he had all the power and he leveraged none for himself, right? And so in Christian marriage, you men have a lot of power and you're not to leverage your power for your benefit, but for the benefit of those people around you, namely your wife and your children. And one of the reasons that marriage is so difficult for so many people, for so many of us, is that we're brought up by parents who think the world of us, that's my baby over there, and that's great. I'm glad that moms love their kids, especially their sons, and so they dote on us, and then we you know, get grown, we go off to college, we begin living the single life, we're living it all about ourselves, then we meet a girl, and they're like, hey, you need to get married, you start living together, and so two distinctly different people are living in the same house, heck, you're sharing the same bed and somehow or another now for the first time in your life you're not supposed to be selfish and that's why marriage is so difficult because a healthy marriage is two individuals levering each other's strengths for the other not for themselves where every other point in your life you have been leveraging your strength for your career for your desires to get the things that you want but in marriage that is not the case And so marriage is part of God's plan and pathway to help make you men more holy and get this, more like Jesus. And so that's that's why marriage is such a really big deal in the eyes of the Lord. Again, not good for man to be alone. Now, yes, there are occasionally some men that are called to be single perpetually forever. People like Paul, that's great. But listen, Paul talks about, he says, I wish most were like me, but most aren't. So you need to get married because being married causes you to think outside of yourself and it's a challenge man it's a challenge to be thinking about what she wants and and how she's feeling because we're not being trained for that we're not being trained for that in our regular lives i mean i think we should be trying to train our children that but we're not doing a good job of that as our culture so that means that while there should be happiness obviously in our marriage the purpose of marriage is not happiness but holiness before the lord now of course there should be happiness I think your spouse would absolutely be your best friend. I mean, certainly when you got married, it wasn't because you hated each other's guts. You know, at one point, you liked each other a whole bunch. You know, you thought each other looked good. You liked hanging out. You used to sit there back in the day anyway. I don't know what the kids do nowadays, but you know, you just sit there on the phone and hear each other breathe. <sighs> there it is. <sighs> you know, just sitting there. You still there? I'm still there. Been on the phone for three hours. Now you can hardly have a conversation for three minutes because you're so busy can't hardly put your cell phone down for 30 seconds to actually have a conversation, right? Isn't that funny how times change? That's why, and it's not because I know, I have been taught, man, that's why husbands lead in dating your spouse. Lead in dating your spouse. Listen, you can either be as a couple, you can either be back to back, which means you're facing away from each other and you're against each other. You can be shoulder to shoulder, which means you're walking alongside, or you can be face to face. Now, shoulder to shoulder is how a lot of us are walking. We're busy, we're accomplishing, we're partners in life, but ultimately the marriage couple is not meant to be shoulder to shoulder, certainly not back to back. It's face to face. It's face to face. And the only time you can really do that is you have to purposely make time in your life, send them kids somewhere Send them so, and listen, I know it's like, well, I the money. Then cancel a TV subscription. Because I can assure you your, 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 your marriage is more important than the internet, more important than HBO Max, whatever that is. Make time, make time, make time to do life face to face and not just shoulder to shoulder. Because if you're not careful, one day, the reason that you're shoulder to shoulder, aka your children, will leave you, and then you're gonna look at each other and say, who are you? Who are you? And no, no, it is always the marriage relationship is the primary goal there. So I'm going to close with this, close with this. So the goal of marriage, again, is not, is not happiness. It includes happiness. But listen, men, if you want to only be happy, get a dog. But if you want to have purpose and fulfillment, then you get a wife. A dog will not give you purpose or fulfillment, but it will love you. Heck, you can kick a dog, and it'll come back and kiss you on the face in an hour you kick your wife, she probably should call the law, to be honest. There won't be much kissing after that. It shouldn't be. So if you want to be happy, get a dog. But if you want to have purpose and fulfillment, get a wife. All right. So marriage is not a prison. 
Marriage is not only about your happiness. And lastly, this is where the PG-13 comes in. Should have had your kids out of here by now. Marriage is not where sex comes to die. Marriage is not where sex goes to die. 1 Corinthians 7, 4 through 5. A wife does not have the rights over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, obviously, if I was preaching just a normal marriage series, normal marriage sermon, I would tie this together. But specifically today, I want to focus on the men, okay? So first, we need to understand that sex is not the sole purpose of marriage. So what, that, what I'm meaning there is, is that you didn't get married only for the sex, that's not, that's not how that's supposed to work. You got married is because God has said it is not good for man to be alone. A portion of that is having a healthy and vibrant sex life. You understand? Now, somebody asked me recently, like, how can you talk about sex and stuff? Well, listen, the reason I can talk about this and not feel ashamed, and honestly, it's going to be for two reasons. One, I was a student pastor for a long stinking time. And to be quite frank, um, it's, it's pretty much the Wild West out there sexually if you haven't been paying attention. And kids are having sex far more earlier. They're being exposed to pornography far earlier than any generation on planet Earth. So I had to get pretty familiar, honestly, with talking about sex with many of your children because the schools aren't talking about it in a healthy way. They're certainly not talking about it in a God-honoring way, right? But the second reason is this. Now, Certainly, since the 60s and 70s and the sexual liberation of that time, it's gotten much easier to talk about sex. It's like, ah, oh, stop holding us down. But the church has had a pretty, pretty bad history of being repressive, you know, when it comes to sex and not want to talk about it. And if you think about many of your grandparents or great-grandparents, like, that generation didn't talk about it at all, right? You don't talk about that kind of stuff. Well, here's the thing. We need to understand, as church people, is that God created sex, is very pro-sex in marriage, Anything outside of that boundary is destructive and it causes pain. But in the context of marriage, it is a beautiful gift that God made for the husband and the wife. And so the church needs to talk about and we need to promote and you need to promote to your children and even to your own mind that sex in marriage is not just a good thing, it's the best thing. It's the right thing. It's the holy thing. Anything outside of those boundaries is literally against God's design. You are trying to use a hammer as a saw. You're trying to do something that looks beautiful, but is ultimately destructive and painful. Every time you have sex outside of the marriage relationships, you are trading part of your soul. You are sinning against your body and the reason that God created you. That's why sexual sin is so devastating. So devastating. So sex is not, or marriage is not, where sex comes to die. Now, the reason I say that is because there's a common critique in popular culture that says, oh, well, you don't want to get married because when you get married, you know, the sex stops. You know? Oh, when you get married, I, I can't believe that you want to sleep with the same person for the rest of your life. Like, we see this stuff all the time in movies. Why can you talk about that? Because we're watching the same movies. Like, we're all watching the same stuff, right? I, I'm not saying anything y'all haven't heard before in any of your TV shows, right? And it's all glamorous, and it's all exciting, and, and the pursuit, and all this kind of stuff like that. Listen, a sex problem in a marriage indicates an, another problem somewhere else in the marriage. Y'all follow me? A sex problem, you know, calls it, there's another problem somewhere else, okay? Usually it doesn't start with the sex. Usually sex is the, is the final result of where a problem is, but... To, to speak specifically on this idea that culture says that, oh, man, you know, sex is, uh, marriage is where sex goes to die. Uh, I'm not even going to use the Bible. I'm going to use the culture to fight against culture. The Huffington Post recently wrote an article that says this. It's on the screens. The belief that singles have more and better sex than married people have, has become a cultural myth that researchers and sociologists are finding to be untrue and coming up with some hard evidence to substantiate this claim. While the single life is glamorized where? On film and on TV. The reality underlying the entertainment media's portrayal of the good life is for many people a far cry from the picture painted by Hollywood in both quantity and quality. It's a lie. 
It is a lie. And even culture sees it. But here's the thing about culture. Here's the thing about things that you must understand about culture. Culture is ultimately structured by the enemies of God to destroy you. And so that's why, like in culture, to put it plainly, how study after study after study talks about this devastation that pornography has had on our culture, the devastation has had on our minds, on our dopamine levels, on the way we process, how it has ruined so many men and so many boys and so many women and so many marriages. Culture can see all that. And in the same article, I've seen it hundreds of times where it says, but yet a little bit of porn still is a pretty good idea. It's like saying, well, if only a little bit of cyanide doesn't kill you, it just makes you sick. It's not that bad, right? It's poison. It's poison because but culture is so two-faced. It can't act because there's no wisdom there. And so that's why we don't look to culture for our answers because it's duplicitous. <laughs> you know, the very thing that's going to show on TV, it's a lie. The single life, the sexualized free life, it's a lie. Matter of fact, here are some stats just to back some of this up. For having sex at least twice a week, I don't know what your frequency is. That's not my concern. But at least twice a week, on average, is what, what a study looked like. Singles, only 5% of singles or people that are dating are having sex at least twice a week, where at least 25% or more of married people are having sex at least twice a week. No sex in the last year. 61% of singles claim that, where only 18% of marriages claimed no sex in the last year. Now, does that mean that Sex is always positive and great and healthy in marriage. No. Why? Because marriage is hard. We've already talked about that. It's where, it's where selfishness has to go to die. You have to become more selfless and, and more giving. And that's why Paul writes these things about, listen, your body doesn't belong to you and your body doesn't belong to you, right? Don't withhold each other. Love each other. But it also means emotionally too. Don't just withhold each other physically. Don't withhold each other emotionally. But listen, usually there's going to be three major problems that a wise person once told me in your marriage. It's either going to be money. It's going to be in-laws or it's going to be sex. Those are always going to be the major three headings of most problems within marriage. And, and a lot of times it's a, it's a mixture of all three, but those are going to be your big three. Money, in-laws, or sex, right? Somebody's, and, you know, and so you need to understand that sex is a, is, a, is a powerful thing within marriage, but it's the first thing that the enemy wants to attack. It's powerful within marriage, but it's the first thing that the enemy wants to attack. So, what I want to do now for the rest of our time is I want to talk about the calling of men in marriage. That's what marriage is not. Marriage is not a prison. Marriage is not all about our happiness. Marriage is not where sex goes to die. But what marriage is and what husbands are so called to do is this. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker partner, showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers, so that your prayers will not be what? Hindered. Dude, you need to understand that the quality of your marriage actually will affect the quality of your prayer life and God answering your prayers. It's a, it's a really, really big deal. It's a really big deal. But I do want to talk about something really fast because anytime I read this verse, um, this is one of those verses because where we read our culture into the Bible versus looking at the Bible and the culture that was in and then reading it out, right? So reading into the culture, when you hear this verse, I can hear it now. I knew it. I knew that Bible was misogynistic, male-centered. It's calling us weak, the weaker vessel. I want to show you an illustration that I saw a pastor do, and I hope this is a little helpful. I love, I love a prop, right? Now, what I have here is a metal, metal tum uh, tum tumbler, right? Like, it's pretty doggone tough. I can throw this around. I can throw in the dishwasher, no concern. A little chip to paint, no big deal. But this will keep ice cold all day long. And here I have a wine glass, right? Now, which one of these is stronger? It's, it's not a trick question. Which one of these is stronger? This, this one, right? Like this, this is a much stronger. Let's not even do that. All right. So we know which one is stronger, right? But which one is better? It depends on what? It depends on context, right? Because if you're going to go work outside in the yard in the heat, you're going to fill this up with some, uh, oh, some sweet tea. Thank you, Lord, we live in the South. With some ice in that joker, it's going to keep it cold for a long time, man. Put that little, little, little straw in this thing. You're going to be drinking this thing all day. But if you show up at the job site with this, what, what are you doing? 
It's, it's the wrong context. Now, granted, when you go out to dinner, though, you're having a nice dinner, I'm going to say if you hand this to the maitre d' and say, fill it full of wine, baby, <laughs> to the brim, that's going to indicate a different kind of problem <laughs> because it's out of context. But this, in its proper context, is the right thing, right? So it all depends on context. So the Bible, what, 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 what the Bible's talking about here, what Paul or what Peter's talking about, is not that that women are are weaker or less than. He literally says a different thing, showing them honors as what as co-heirs. Y'all bring that verse back up as co-heirs of life, life in, in the grace of life, so that your prayers not be hindered. And so Paul is not speaking in a. Or, I'm sorry, Peter. Peter's not speaking in a way that says that women are less than. You are co-heirs, but he's speaking practically, and we have to have practical conversations. And that first part leads us to this first thing, that men are called to honor their wife physically. You are to honor your wife physically. So what that means is leveraging your strength for her behalf. And not just physical strength, but also your mental strength and your emotional strength. That means that when she is weak, you don't prey on her weakness, you build her back up in your strength. You leverage it for her. So what this means is, we as men, as godly men in marriage, should never under any circumstance intimidate, use any kind of violence or abuse, whether that's physical certainly or verbal, use anger to your advantage or bully your spouse. That is quite literally the most ungodly, unchristlike thing you can do as a spouse. Because let me Remind you again, your standard isn't other men. Your standard isn't pastors or men who write marriage books. Your standard is Christ Jesus. And he at no point ever leveraged his literal godlike power that he used to create all of us for his own benefit, but laid it aside so that when it came time for the judgment of the world, it fell on him instead of us. You leverage your strength. You honor your wife physically. Your wife is always your ally and should be treated as such. And one last thought on this. That means honoring her body physically through sex. That means being honorable. That means not trying to use her just as an outlet for your frustrations. That means you honor her physically by pursuing her emotionally. You honor her physically by sometimes letting a back rub just be a back rub. Quite frankly, some of y'all like, I don't know if I should laugh here or not because we're in church and nobody knows where to say amen. It's fine. It's fine. I, I get it. <laughs> should only be a back rub. Hey, amen. Oh, no, wrong place, right? I don't know. I don't know. See, godly men, we don't get sex through guilt, pity, or anger, or shame because we leverage our strength and we honor our wives physically. See, your sex life should not be because she has to, but because of the mutual love that you share for one another. And ultimately, sex is not the end result. It's just a piece of what makes a happy, healthy Christian marriage. It's not the end result. You don't work hard so she'll sleep with you. You don't buy her flowers so she'll sleep with you. You do all of those things because you're trying to win her heart. That's what a godly marriage is all about. I will say on this last part too, and I, I know these things are uncomfortable, but guys, we, we have to understand the devastation because, see, I'm living in the world with you, but I'm reading all of these things. I'm reading the articles. I'm reading the reports that many of us probably don't, y'all don't have time to do. But listen, honoring her physically means keeping your eyes on her alone. Now, I know that is extremely difficult today because you can't hardly watch a TV show without seeing another naked woman or naked dude at this point. Now, I am going to advise you as your pastor, and I'm probably going to come across as more extreme than the average bear, but because I live in the world of marriage counseling and the devastation that a lot of this brings, but number one, there is no okay use of pornography in any way. Women don't even fall for the thing of, let's watch it together. Absolutely not. Your eyes are supposed to be for each other. 
Now, the fact of the matter is with pornography today, the average male or many average men have seen more naked women in, in the first few years of you know, adulthood than most men have ever seen in their entire lives of any generation uh, previously before us, okay? And it has done something not great to our brains. It has rewired our brains. That is the over-sexualization of even young girls and women in our culture because of pornography. And again, culture can see that, but then it doesn't want to shut it down because again, it's just, it's just, it's just nuts out there because who's the power of the air? Who's controlling culture, right? It's always the enemy of God, but there's no instance ever that pornography is okay. I will say, men, if you are struggling with that, the only way to break the addiction of pornography is through confession and coming clean. Now, I know it's like, bro, you don't understand. No, I'm telling you, it is a cancer that has to be removed with a knife. And you can pray all you want to to the Lord to please, please, please heal me. And you might do good for a week, two weeks, a month, but that sin must be brought to light. Sin shrinks in the light. Number two with this, this is where it's going to be a little extreme. You need to be very careful what you watch on television. Amen. I know there's a lot of popular shows, but you just need to be careful. I don't care if you watch them together. I, I don't care. Listen, you just need to be careful. I am of the opinion that the only person that you should see naked is your spouse. Amen. And why is that? Because God has made you one, and as a man, men are. I don't, I don't know if I know a man that cannot lust while looking at a naked woman regardless of what context it is. Well, it's art. No, you know? So you just need to watch your eyes, okay? You need to be very, very diligent in watching. And again, don't wait for your wife to, to put pressure on you. Be the leader. Be the leader. Anyway, boy, I know this is tense and awkward, but it is what it is, you know? If I ain't gonna talk about who is, you know? Anyway, so whatever. Number two, I gotta kind of hurry. Honor your wife emotionally. Men, we're called to honor our wives emotionally. That means don't turn marriage into a job description where you just do your job and, and she does hers. And again, it's the shoulder to shoulder. We're not walking shoulder to shoulder. See, for many men, uh, while we think we're doing the right thing, and in some ways we are, you know, we're providing, we're doing this, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're making a way, making a life. But what we do is we omit the emotional side of her needs. And so we can say, well, I was there for her, but were you there emotionally for her? And I don't buy into this thing that men are not emotional. Emotionally stunted men are not emotional. But let me remind you again, let's say the, literally the perfect man that ever existed while walking to the tomb of his best friend Lazarus, who, by the way, he knew he was about to resurrect, but when he saw the pain in their eyes and he saw the reality of death and what it causes, what does it? The shortest verse in the Bible, you probably all have it memorized, and Jesus, and Jesus wept. So, so being emotionally available for your wife isn't weakness, it's necessary. It is your calling as a man not to just leverage your physical strength, but even your emotional strength, but also exposing your emotional vulnerability. Now, why is that dangerous? Because we know when we expose ourselves emotionally and we become vulnerable, we open ourselves up to what? The possibility of being hurt. So that means, that's why we have the third one, so we always honor our wife verbally. We honor, our, we honor our wives verbally. See, because when we become emotionally vulnerable to somebody, you then know exactly what to say to inflict the most pain. Now, here's my really big challenge to the men, okay? This means no backhanded compliments. This means no harsh and critical words. This means no improper talk when she's not around, when you're among your friends. And that means absolutely never, ever speaking ill against your wife to your children. That is their mother. I don't care what the situations are. You don't do that. Now, now I get it because I, I, I know the real world. Well, you don't know what she says to me. You don't know what she says to me. Listen, you let God deal with her. You be the leader that God has called you to do because, again, I'm going to point us back to Jesus. So when Jesus was being, you know, spit on and whipped and a crown of thorns on his head and finally the culmination, they're nailing him to a tree. And what does he finally speak? He's silent the whole time. And when Jesus finally says something, what does he say? Forgive them for they know not what they do. That's our standard. So when she attacks you, you hold your tongue. You don't jump back. You don't try to one-up her, up the ante. Well, you blah blah this, or your our kids this, or whatever. Absolutely not. You shut it down. You shut it down. So, honey, we are not going to speak this way to each other. 
I feel like you are disrespecting me this moment and it makes me feel disrespected. And it does hurt me, but I love you and we will not speak this way to each other. You shut it down. You be the leader. I don't care what she says. Be the leader. Be like Christ in your home. Be the Jesus in your home that you are called to be. And last one, number four. Honor your wife financially. The fourth way a man honors his wife is honoring your wife financially. First Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. <laughs> Bible ain't playing, folks. I'm just, I'm just saying. Now, let me, let me put a little asterisk on this. Every time we talk about something hard in a culture, we have a, a yeah, but culture. Yeah, but what about, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so we take the most extreme cases and make them seem like they're the majority. Uh, that doesn't actually exist. Uh, yes, there is a minority of men who have had physical disabilities or something has happened to them that changes their ability to work and provide for a family. Man, God bless you. God will work through that. There are different callings for different seasons, certainly. But on average... Last week we talked about that God has built into every man a desire to work. And your ultimate calling and fulfillment in your family life will come through you providing for your family. Lady, that's why you don't need to go marry boys. We talked about that last week because a boy still wants to live with his mama playing video games while she pays his bills and he's just waiting for you to come along to pay him for her. No, you need to be marrying a man that can make a way for you and your family in the world. Now, hear what I'm saying. Because, this again, this is, this is a tense topic. I'm trying to make sure I watch my words. I think it's fine if the wife wants to go work in the home. But from a scriptural perspective, it is the man's responsibility from the sight of God to provide. And it is the woman's responsibility to steward the home and the children. That doesn't mean that the wife can't go work, but what often happens is, is that the man does his portion and then the wife has to share in his portion while also doing her portion too. And so I want to say that it is our job as men that if your family is in a spot and your wife needs to be more available, that is up to you, bro, to make that happen. You get another job, make a way, cut out spending, budget your money, whatever it means so that your wife can do her God-given role for your family because it is your shoulders that are supposed to bear the financial responsibility. And this isn't just my idea. I'm not trying to say, like, this is Dustin's idea. This is what Scripture's saying. I'm just trying to preach to you the Bible. As, as offensive as it may seem, this is the way that God has created and designed us to function. So other ways of honoring her financially. That means stewarding what you have well. Do you need to be paying the payments on that truck or that car or the house that you need to? Because because here's the thing, I'm gonna, I might get in trouble here. I might get in trouble, but I'm gonna really challenge somebody right now, and this might be the email that I get right here. Some of you, you and your wife are drowning, but you're trying to keep up appearances, but your children and your marriage is suffering. You need to financially downsize, and that might include cars, house, boat and the like so that your, fam your, your wife can be the mother that she needs to be, so you can be the husband that you need to be, and your family can live within your means. And I know that's a really big challenge because culture ain't going to tell you that. Culture will chew you up, though, and spit you out with pleasure. But God, your father, wants you to flourish, and not just you. You do realize the next generation of Christians more than likely will come from Christian homes. And so I, I do wonder sometimes if the reason that marriage has such a bad rap is that we have treated it with such disregard as Christian believers that even Christian kids are like, why do I want to get married? When it's the best blessing of your life. It's the greatest blessing. Listen, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, who is more valuable than any precious treasure, any jewels or pearls, says the wisest man who ever lived. So as men, I want to give you some tips and then we're done because I am going a little bit over my time here, as typical. All right, number one, I'm sorry, I'm trying. Number one, here are just some quick tips. As the family leader, Husbands and men, you need to model humility, honesty, service, selflessness, and repentance. Number two, these are all on the sermon notes, by the way, if you want to go back and read them. Make sure everyone in your household 
has a good age-appropriate Bible. Be the spiritual leader of your home. If your wife needs a better study Bible, you need a better study Bible, make sure your kids have a Bible they can understand. Make sure that they have access to the Word of God in a way they can understand. You need help, like literally, this is my job. I know this stuff. I don't know much, but I know this stuff. Come talk to one of us. Number three, make the most of your time by listening to good sermons or classes on your commute or free time. Be a student of your faith so that you can answer your family's questions. Listen, I'm not the spiritual leader of your household. I'm the spiritual leader of this church and the spiritual leader of my household, but not your household. And so I know there will be questions that occasionally you won't know the answer to, but I do have a deep, deep, deep concern in our culture that if your wife or your kids or your friends were to come ask you even some basic tenets of Christianity, do you think you would have the answer? And, and here's the thing. It isn't because we don't have a lack of resources. You can listen to the best Bible teachers of the last 200 years in this moment for free. It's a, it's a designation of priority and time. And so be the spiritual leader that your family needs and make sure you understand your faith in a good, consistent way. Be the spiritual leader of your family. Number four, I would highly encourage you to push for family dinner. I realize it's not practical all the time. We don't do it all the time. There are seasons of life, you know, kids older, younger, sports, all this kind of stuff, understand. But you need to be collectively sitting down together as a family. And again, don't wait for your wife to suggest it. You suggest, you want to be a hero? You want to be a hero? Go home and says, honey, I would like us to start eating more as a family together. Man, just brownie points. Number five, and this might be the biggest challenge, pray regularly with your spouse and kids. Let them hear you pray out loud. Let them hear you talk about God. Let them hear you share your struggles and your concerns, but also your victories and how God has moved in your life. See, we men carry a greater burden before the Lord for the well-being of our wife and family. And I don't say that to scare you. I say that to challenge you. Because when men step into their purpose and design, everything around you flourishes. But when you choose not to, everything around you burns. So I want to close there. I'd love everybody to stand up with me. I know this is hard. I know this is intense talk. Last few weeks has been intense. I get it. We got one more, maybe not quite as intense. We're talking about fatherhood next week. Talking about fatherhood next week. Um, but man, man, I just want to encourage you to be the men that God is calling you and equipped you to be for your families. Of course, during our response time, you always can go to the cross for response, whether that's laying down burdens or prayer requests, the altar or communion. Maybe some of you need to grab your wife's hand and you need to go to the crosses or come and pray. But I'd love for you to stick around for just a few minutes as we respond and worship. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the men in this room, for the families they represent. And I pray, and I pray that in all your mercy and grace, Lord, that you you forgive us of where we have fallen short as husbands, as fathers, as men, as leaders, and that you would equip every one of us to step into with strength and confidence the calling you have placed before us for our families, for our spouses, for our future spouses, Lord, for our future families, Lord. Prepare us, heal us, equip us, lead and guide us all in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and together say amen. amen. Let's worship.